Hi, my name is Dr. Don Wicker, and we're going to continue our lecture series on organizational behavior, and today we're talking about learning and reinforcement. Learning and reinforcement. Learning and reinforcement. In, in today's lecture series, lecture series number four, we're going to look at the role of classical and operant conditioning. We're going to look at contingency of reinforcement, influencing behavior. We're going to look at the four schedule reinforcements and explain each briefly. And finally, we're going to look at the social learning theory. We're going to explain the development of behaviors looking at the social learning theory. In classical conditioning, what do we basically mean? Well, if you remember Pavlov's experiment when he used food to make a dog salivate and then to get the dog to eat, of course, whenever he rang the bell, the dog was conditioned to salivate. And that's what we mean when we basically talk about classical conditioning. Therefore, what do we mean when we talk about operant behaviors and their consequences, operant conditioning? Think about this. Think about when you work, of course, you expect a paycheck. When you come in late for work, you expect to be docked. And the same thing, when you go into a restaurant, you expect to eat. And of course, finally, if you enter a grocery store, you expect to buy food. Those are basically operant consequences of behavior. Examples of contingent reinforcement. Think about a manager and employee setting goals. Okay, the employee achieves the goal, which means that the manager is going to compliment the employee, he's going to give them encouragement. However, when that employee does not achieve the goal, there could be some type of rap, reprimand or some type of punishment that's involved, which is basically what we mean when we talk about contingent reinforcement. Three, two, one. Principles of positive reinforcement. We have four principles. We have contingent reinforcement, which only reinforces desired behavior. We have immediate reinforcement. Of course, whenever that event occurs, uh, reinforcement's given immediately after to keep that desired behavior. We have reinforcement size. The size makes a big difference. Uh, the larger the amount of the reinforcement, the greater the effect. And finally, we have reinforcement deprivation. When we deprive reinforcement, we are trying to induce a certain uh, type of behavior. Rewards used by organizations. Some of the rewards that organizations use to um, get a certain type of behavior from their employees, of course, they use pay. They use pay raises, profit sharing. Some of the supplemental rewards that are used could be pension, health benefits, uh, company automobiles. Some of the symbols that can also be used could be a corner office, uh, different type of drapes or, or type of carpeting or painting that uh, is displayed in a particular office. Those are some of the rewards that are used by organizations. Continuing on those lines of rewards, we also have social rewards, personal rewards. And, and some of the personal rewards could be like praise from a boss, um, a wall plaque. We also have rewards from a task. You could have job autonomy, self-direction, self-empowerment. And finally, you could have self-administered rewards. What are self-administered rewards? Well, you could give yourself praise. You could give yourself um, recognition, congratulations. There's nothing wrong with rewarding yourself for uh, doing a particular task successfully. In learning and reinforcement, you also have to understand that how to make punishment effective. Occasionally, employees are going to have to be punished, and what should you do? Well, of course, you should praise in public and punish in private. Uh, punishment should be something that's discussed on a one-on-one -on -one basis between an employee and a manager. Pinpoint specifically and describe the undesirable behavior to be avoided. Develop alternatives to desired behavior. And use pleasant and unpleasant events in balance should be balanced in that situation when you're using pleasant and unpleasant events. <clears throat> guidelines for using contingencies of reinforcement. Some of the guidelines, of course, do not reward employees the same. Uh, the consequences of both actions and non-action should not be the same. And we should always strive to make employees aware of the behavior to be reinforced. They have to know what you're reinforcing. And let employees know how and what they are doing wrong, which is real important. It, it, I've heard time and time again that employees didn't realize what they were doing wrong. That's one of the big, big keys in organizational behavior. And do not punish in front of others, as I stated before. And lastly, make the managerial response equal to the worker's behavior. 
Think about that. Make the managerial response equal to the worker's behavior, which should always go hand in hand. Let's look at the five dimensions of the social learning theory. In the five dimensions of social learning theory, we have symbolism, forethought, vicarious learning, self-control, and self-efficacy. Let's take a look at self-efficacy. Self-efficacy at work. What happens to self-efficacy at work? Well, think about it. You have past accomplishments, which helps you to perform better in the future. Um, if you know you can do, uh, accomplish a certain task, of course, that's going to give you a high self-efficacy. You're going to be able to set goals. You're going to be able to learn whatever that task is and perform better. However, if you have a low self-efficacy, meaning that you have had failures in the past, uh, it's going to give you an um, emotional state, believing that you cannot accomplish a specific task. Low self-efficacy is developed over time because of non-performance uh, in, in certain, certain tasks. Make sure employees have the competencies required by the new behaviors. That's real important in the social learning theory. They have to have the competencies. Structure a positive learning situation, provide positive consequences, and develop organizational practices that maintain newly learned behaviors. You must have newly learned behaviors and organizational practices. Finally, let's take a brief look at self-control. Conditions of effective use of self-control. What do we mean by self-control? Of course, uh, a person must be able to engage in behaviors that he or she would normally want to perform and use self-reinforcers. And lastly, set goals that determine when self-reinforcers are to be applied. That's kind of a brief overview of Lecture series number four, and I want to thank you for your time, and I, I look forward to talking to you again in lecture series number five.